بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا um, Welcome again everyone thank you for being here I know these are very difficult times um, and I was asked even before I came here if I was going to address um, the current crisis in beloved Palestine. And honestly, I feel so ill-equipped uh, to do that. I don't know where to begin. I think we're all kind of, for lack of a better word or phrase, shell-shocked you know, by what we're witnessing. It's traumatic to keep turning on your phone. Um, last night I received a phone call a little late and um, I, I mentioned that I was watching videos because I couldn't keep my eyes off of it. But I know that I need to sleep, but I can't. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who's struggling with balance right now, right? We're probably of, you know, so distracted at work with our kids, wherever we are, because our heart is over there wondering what's going on. Our mind is obviously we have to live, we have to exist, we have to continue life. Um, and then the guilt, you know, of what we refer to often as like survivor's guilt or just being so far removed from a place where you see people who are suffering um, beyond words. We definitely are juggling a lot of emotions. And so I, I really felt so like, I don't know what, what I would say other than, you know, saying the best of words, which is making dua and just calling upon Allah for our brothers and sisters. And that really is the best thing that we can do. Um, we can't obviously be there no matter how much we wish we could, right? We can't physically be there. But the best thing that we can do is um, is to offer our, our gods. And so that's, you know, what I'm, what I'm hoping to do, inshallah, in the form of, you know, our dhikr that we just did. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. I apologize. I'm just trying to get all this situated here, and it's not working for me. Yes. Oh, did you? Sure, it should be foundations of the spiritual path, but I can also send it to you once I get all of this. I'm sorry, I'm distracted here, but um, what I was saying is that, inshallah, the best thing I think we can do is to make dua for continuous dua. I mean, that's not obviously the only thing we can do. We can do much more than that, but in this space, my hope is that everything we do here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears our pleas, hears our calls, our hearts are broken and that he accepts our, our plea to bring relief and to prevent catas catastrophic events from unfolding. Because every day it seems like we're just at the edge of our seat waiting for what's next. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring, um, bring peace to, the, to our, our brothers and sisters and uh, inshallah. And like I said, that's what we can do and that's what we're, we hope to do here. But we're going to discuss... Um, a text, uh, and that's really what what I wanted to share with with you all here. Did you send it to me? I think I got it. Okay. So for those who have iPhones, Mary is um, going to airdrop a PDF, and that PDF is the text that we started last month when we officially started our halakas here, and it's a an incredible text that I've that I've been very blessed to um, read multiple times and each time I feel like I get so much from it but it's called the foundations of the spiritual path and um, you can certainly fi find it um, if you uh, if you do a google but it'll take a little bit of time you just have to put in foundations of the spiritual path and then the word sandala that's the website that it is currently on it's a pdf it's free for everybody everybody can read it but we started this last month, and the, you know, the reason why we started this text is because we're all seekers, right? Every one of us is here, um, here or in the virtual space. Inshallah, we're believers, and we want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the path is sometimes confusing, or there's so many paths. So you're like, where do I go? Where do I start? So I explained last time that what I love about this text is it quite literally, as the title suggests, is giving us the roadmap of how a person who's really sincere about being a practitioner of their faith, a believer, a Muslim, should, you know, how they should do this. What are the 
preliminary steps? How does one um, begin to even embark on this journey? And so the way that it's structured is a really wonderful text because Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, he's a, I mean, a, a master of so many sciences, but he's a deep psychologist. He understands the human being and he knows that we, um, you know, we work well when we have the goal in mind. So he actually starts his treatise here with the five foundations first. Like this is what you need to even be on the spiritual path. So he lays that out. And then the rest, mashallah, assalamu alaikum. So, such an honor. Alhamdulillah. We have sisters coming from Sacramento, which always is just so, so humbling to me. Mashallah. Subhanallah. Um, so he lays these um, five of the foundations first, and then the rest of the text is the building block, or the build, are the building blocks to get to the five. So I find it just fascinating how he did it. So we covered, and I'm just going to summarize because, mashallah, there's a lot of new people here, and then we'll continue the reading. But he says here, if anyone is asked about the foundation of his path, he should reply, the foundation of our path are five. First, taqwa, mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, privately and publicly. And I'm going to go quickly over each of them, and then we'll come back and review the second is adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. Then indifference to whether others accept or reject one. Contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease. And turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prosperity and adversity. So essentially, if you even want to be on the spiritual path, these are the five goals to be on the path. And then, of course, it's the building of that that is, you know, the... the the objective of every believer is that we continue to grow, we continue to enhance our understanding, our knowledge, our practice. But this is the this is it. So taqwa, mindfulness of Allah, privately and publicly, this is again really important to think about because taqwa we hear this word a lot. It's a it's often obviously it's an important term. It's essential to our faith. But the disclaimer that he puts here is also very interesting because it's suggesting again that we are prone to maybe either or, that we may be privately, we have taqwa, right? Um, and then publicly, we may have cowardice. And there are Muslims who don't want to show that they're Muslim outside, you know? So they're, they're devoted inside, but then when they are in public, maybe they have other issues going on. Maybe there's a fear or something else, you know, that's at play. So they may behave differently, completely differently. And there are people, unfortunately, who... That is true. They will have different, uh, you know, masks or just they, they, they behave differently outwardly and inwardly. That could be, or the opposite, where, and this would be even worse, right, that publicly you put on this uh, self-righteousness and you act very, um, you know, as though you are very devoted and you're very, you know, um, you're very righteous in your actions, but then privately you're a total different person. You don't pray. You maybe eat, even eat and drink haram. You speak, you know, of foul things. You're looking at foul things. But then in public spaces, you're just an angel, right? So the fact that he put both is dealing with both groups, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. You can't hide from him. So you better make sure that you're consistently someone who has this quality of taqwa. That it doesn't work with either or, or one or the other, but both have to be maintained. So that's the first one. And then adherence to the sunnah and word and deed is also important because it goes to the same idea of people who may understand or read, you know, uh, the, the practices of the Prophet I mean, we have people whose entire, you know, childhood or upbringing may have been surrounded by um, grandparents or or aunts and uncles or teachers, you know, in the Sunday school. So they were always learning, right? And they may know. They're, I know people who have a lot of things memorized because they were in those environments, but they don't act on it, right? And so the consistency of if you are going to really be a person who follows the path of the Prophet Wasallam, that it's not lip service, right? Um, but you're actually, it's manifesting in your actions. You actually show in your actions that you really, because um, we, we can, uh, of course, admire him. He is the praised one, his name. He's, he's praised, so we can certainly be in awe of 
him, his character, all of his virtues, all of his traits. But if we're not, if that's not translating to actions that we, you know, we do ourselves, then there's something missing, right? So it has to be both. And then he says, indifference to whether others accept or reject one. Now, this is a really big one because we're in the midst of, I mean, I don't know. I saw reports from CARE earlier that the volume of calls they're getting, you know, from people who've experienced some really terrible things, you know, we're seeing a rise in sentiments that are all too familiar, right? For those of us who were alive after 9-11 and have seen the trajectory of just the landscape politically for Muslims in this country and in the West, it has not been very good. And unfortunately, just when you think maybe we're growing as a country and a world favorably, and maybe we're making some inroads with more and more elected officials and more political activism, we actually find that, nope, it took one, you know, this this um, unfortunate uh, tragedy to unfold to see. Again, we're going over the five foundations of the spiritual path by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. So he mentions taqwa, mindfulness of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala privately and publicly, adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. And then the third point indifference to whether others accept or reject one. So this is really a big one because we live in a time where we are worried, we are concerned either individually or collectively about the image, right, of, of how people see us. And so when you are a person who is on the haq, on the right, then the consideration is always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that is the only one, or he he is the only one that we are concerned about in terms of being accepted uh, or you know rejected, and and we don't worry other than that because if you if you think about it, it's um, you know again if if you make your life's mission to gain the rida of Allah subhanahu wa taala, then there's nothing to worry about. But when you're trying to please this group or that group, you find, and I'm sure we've all experienced this in our own little you know worlds that there's no way that you can make everybody happy. You will always find people who will have something to say, who will, you know, complain. And, and so human beings, that's just, it's futile. It's futile to try to please people. But redirecting your heart and your your mission to seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, um, is really important. And then, you know, also not being worried if you're left out. You know, there's a lot of people who are very concerned about not just being accepted, but also worried about being left out of, of certain circles. And these are all things that we as believers have to really, again, think about. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter as long as we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the proof of that is look at the prophets, right? How many of them were completely ostracized? And so they their stories are meant for us to see that even if you're up against hundreds or thousands or a few handful because 124,000 prophets, right? We don't have all of their stories, but we can kind of imagine that a lot of them likely f faced, you know, a, a backlash, were pushed out, you know, most of them, if not all of them, experienced that to a certain degree. So, but what, what were they, where was their focus? Their focus was entirely on Allah, Allah. And then in all of their cases, they had tawfiq to some degree, right? Uh, to some degree, they had tawfiq. I mean, they have tawfiq with Allah, but even with uh, on their mission. So it's just futile to worry about being accepted or rejected. And then contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease. This is a big one because it's relatable again to everything we're going through right now. There, and I know, and I know other you know friends of mine who are also in these roles. You know, they they, they teach or they have some connection with the community. They're dealing with people who are struggling in their faith because of everything that's happening, right? It's like, how, how can this happen? And these are questions that have been posed from the beginning of time. Human beings have grappled with evil and the problem of evil. And so these are nothing new, but when we're witnessing at such, in such volume and it's relentless, it can take a toll, right, on the, on the heart. And this is where, of course, Iblis, you know, comes into the picture as well because we're vulnerable. Right? We're trying to make sense of things that don't make any sense to us. And it's too much. It's overwhelming. You know, our fitra is, we're repelled by things like this. You know, to see evil, that even the most, you know, secular, atheist person who has no concept of, you know, objective morality or God or, or these things that we hold true in our faith, 
they can objectively look at what's going on and say, this is sadistic. This is pure evil. Like this is something that's non, you know, inhumane on every level. So it's because we're created in fitra to be repelled by such things. So when we're seeing it at such a high level, it's going to really be a, a means by which Iblis will come and try to distort our understanding, right? And this is what he does very well. He starts to make us question things, you know, and, and even, and that's why we have to be very careful that even if things are hard, which they will be, dunya is not easy. And that's, that to me, that's all, honestly one of the, one of the points of our faith that I feel like is such a proof of its truth is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, there's no sugar coating at all. It's all very clear. You're going to be tested, all of us. You're going to see pain. You're going to see suffering. You're going to see evil. You're going to see oppression. You're going to lose things, lose people that you love and care about, and it's not going to make any sense to you. But do you believe that God, in his wisdom and knowledge, that 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 he, he that it all it does make sense. We just don't have you know the like the the story of uh, Rumi, which is the ant and the carpet. You know, the ant is moving about the carpet, has no idea because it sees colors and patterns. He it cannot perceive the intricacy of the carpet. It just looks all you know scattered. But the bird's eye view or a view above can see that this is a beautiful pattern laid out. And that's really the essential, you know, formula of, of, of understanding dunya is that it all, in the knowledge of God, makes perfect sense. Even if it doesn't make sense to you and me. And if you're patient and if you have trust in your Lord, then you will know that there will come a day where the debts will fall due. Justice will be given. All the questions that you have that are puzzling you will be answered. All that's required of you is patience. Can you be patient? This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting before the human being. And in that patience, can you also maintain your good opinion of God? Right? Because you have to, I mean, if you're patient, but then you still allow your heart to waver, you have to deal with that. What's going on? Do, I, do you not know who your Lord is? Right? All the stories that he's revealed to you in the Quran, all the hadith, all the stories that are meant to give you a concrete, right, understanding of your creator. Do you waver now just because something disturbs you, just some, because something doesn't go your way? Or do you understand that rida, contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether you're going through ease or hardship, is required of you as a believer because you are you're in submission. You understand who he is, and you you know. You, and, and the thing is, I, again, I find it interesting that we can have this mentality for people in our lives. I guarantee, you, if we did a survey, you know, however, um, you know, uh, big the survey was, but if we did a survey and we asked a lot of people if they had someone in their life that they trusted a thousand percent, you know? Many people would say yes, right? How about you guys? Do you have someone in your life that you feel you're so convinced that they would take a bullet for you, that they would do anything for you, no questions even asked? Like I said, now Abu Bakr to the Prophet right? We know how beautiful their relationship was. Do you have someone in your life that you feel like, yeah, I think they would take a hit for me without even any explanation? Do you? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? There you go. Right? Siblings, spouses, parents, mothers, right? How many of us believe wholeheartedly that our mother, because inshallah she's a good, she is, or if she's passed on, Allah my mother, for example, that she would have done anything for us. Inshallah, we all have parents or family members or loved ones or friends even. There are friends who are, like again, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu so we can conceive a loyalty with human beings, you know, like that. Like this strong, unshakable bond. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we allow those thoughts to sometimes get in. And that's where you have to take your own 
nafs to task. Be like, astaghfirullah, what am I talking about? This is my creator. He literally brought me into existence out of nothing. I didn't have to be here. And then he gave me this, this, and this, and this. And you start going through that process and you realize that those were just, it's shaitan. He, he's the one who plants those seeds. But this is important that we, we have to really, just the same way that you would when things are going easy for you, that you have contentment with Allah, it's the same when something goes hard, which is the, the, the brother that I mentioned in the beginning. I mean, I was moved to tears because you see him, like he's so, he loves Allah no matter what. His children were just taken, two of them. I can't even imagine. I have two sons. I cannot imagine. May Allah protect all of us from ever having to suffer such a tremendous loss. But to see this man speak with so much confidence in Allah was like, yes, that's so beautiful. What iman does he have? But guess what? All of us are capable of that if we have an intimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we really are doing exactly what we're prescribed to do. You know, read his words, call on him. He will what? As he says, right? Walk toward me. I will run toward you. Reach your hand out to me. I'll reach my arm out to you. This is Allah's words. So we, we all have access, subhanAllah, but it's on us to challenge those negative thoughts and to make sure that our loyalty to him is pure, it's real. So that's the fourth foundation. The fifth one is where it's now action, right? The, the, the fourth is like your state, that you're, you have this perpetual state of rida. The fifth one is that when you, whether you're in prosperity or adversity, that you are consistently turning to Allah. That you don't forget Him because things, when the, you know, things get good for some people, they just, they move on. It's like God is only there, needed, al billah, when I'm falling apart. That's the only time I turn to God. But as soon as I get everything I want, I'm just coasting, I'm loving life. And then, oh yeah, I forgot to pray. Oh well, it's okay. Astaghfirullah. So we can't uh, justify that. We have to be constantly turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter what and never never getting too safe right because that's the delusion of dunya is that and I think that's probably why those in the west are having more of a difficulty than people in Gaza right now there are people in Gaza of course they're overwhelmed it's horrible it's it's logistically a nightmare no food no drink but their iman has not been destabilized that's why they can still call on Allah. Why is it that we're here in the West so far removed from all of that, but we are suffering these faith crises and asking all these odd questions about Allah and why this, why that? Why? Because this last point, we, get, we got too safe, right? Or we fell into this false sense of security because we're over here in our cushioned lives and this is the delusion of dunya. So what happens is you just stop thinking about your own inevitable mortality, right? Death becomes this distant thing. But when you're living in conflict areas, you're living, you know, where you don't, you, your your water is rationed. Like I, I traveled, you know, to to parts of the Muslim world where I, the first time I ever went to a Muslim country, the water was rationed, and I was shocked because. I didn't understand that concept. Obviously, we just turn on the tap and we get whatever we want. But they, every week, I was staying with a family, mashallah, and they had a t these tanks of water that they were, they had to preserve for the whole week until the government, you know, restored their water. And so showers, showers were like drops. It was, a, it was drops of water and it was painful for a a Westerner who's like, what is this? But subhanAllah, I had to do it. And I, trust me, appreciate showers so much more because experiencing that in the summer was life-changing. So we're just too comfortable in our security. And what happens when you're too comfortable, you forget, right, that the hadith where the Prophet said, a person will wake up in the morning and, and they can you know, lose their faith by the evening or be uh, in the evening and they could lose their faith in the morning. This is a very real reality, astaghfirullah. That's how we, that's how much awareness, acute awareness and mindfulness we have to have every day, um, you know, about the potential of, of 
what could happen to us at any given moment, whether it's a spiritual, you know, calamity, which is the worst of all. Like, dunya, material calamities are nothing. You lose your, you know, car, your phone. These are nothing. They're material things. But the greatest calamity is to lose your faith. So this is where that constant sense of, like, gratitude will kick in if you're practicing exactly, you know, all five of these, but especially this last one, which is you're in, you're turning to Allah always. You're just in constant remembrance, constant thicket, constant gratitude, and you're aware that He could, at any given moment, pluck you out of this dunya. And not one of us have a guarantee. And that, that um, again, hypervigilance about your, um, about these things is what makes you continuously again turn. So these are the five, and it's so powerful. I mean, again, you could just spend so much time talking about these five. But he goes on to say, and now he's kind of breaking it down. Um, he get, he says, the realization of mindfulness of Allah is through scrupulousness and uprightness. So if you want to practice true mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa taqwa, then you have to hold yourself accountable not to you know, break the rules or bend the rules or kind of get sloppy, you know, with your practice of faith. Scrupulousness is being attentive, you know, to what you do. And it's interesting, again, because in the worldly sense, for work, none of us, even for school, whether you're a student or you work, we don't turn in sloppy work because we know there's consequences, right? We're going to get reprimanded. We're going to, you know, have a, a so, something's going to happen that we don't, we want to avoid, so mentally, we know that we have to do a good job. But interesting, again, when it comes to our um, faith practice, we can get sloppy. And this is where you have to be mindful of yourself. So what does that look like practically? And I'll give you an example. It's happened to me several times, subhanAllah. We get up to pray, and then you forget what rakah you're on, right? And I know I'm not the only one. Brain is distracted constantly, ADHD, everything. We have it. So I'm like, Ya Allah, what raka am I on? And then, of course, we can do such as so, which is the prayer of forgetfulness. You can do all of that. But sometimes I get so upset with myself, and I'm just sharing, like, my own way of trying to implement this. I get so frustrated with myself, and I'm ashamed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks me so of such little time, right, that I don't even remember what raka I was on or what surah I just read. I'm like, where was my brain? What, what happened? What memory came in? Because you get a random thought that I feel disgusted, and then I say, I'm doing my whole prayer all over again. So that's like just one example of trying to hold yourself to a higher standard, because it's not good enough to just submit, you know, the bar is so low, here's my bare minimum first draft, you know. If you have time, right, let's say you're home and you're in your pajamas and you're comfortable, what is preventing you from saying, that prayer was so poorly done, it requires a do-over. It's your nafs. Because the nafs is like, well, I just put in all that energy. And and again, like, I like to have, like, conversations where I'm challenging my own nafs. Because it is a polarized kind of, you know, conflict, internal conflict we all go through. So the nafs will pose all of these arguments, right, that justify. It's justifications. But we have to be well-versed enough within ourselves to counter those arguments. So, you know, if you if you give in to the idea that, oh, I'm so tired, you know, my body's so tired, then I like to challenge and say, you know what, that's such a lie, because right now, if like my sisters or close friends came to the door, you know, and they knocked on the door and said, hey, let's go out, you know, let's go to the mall, <laughs> right, or let's go for a walk, we'd be all out the door, so where did the fatigue go, right? It's the nafs, because in the moment that he, you know, that you're about to do something good, he, it'll interject with this ridiculous idea. And then we fall for it, and then we just move on, and we carry on, and we don't think twice. So being scrupulous is saying, no, it's not good enough. I have to do better. Um, and this can be applied to everything, the food that we eat, uh, when we're, you know, interacting with the opposite sex. This is really important. All of us have to take ourselves to account. You know, you, you, you have to know yourself that there's requirements of, you know, gender interactions. How am I interacting? Am I trying to, you know, look a certain way? You know, am I trying to be perceived a certain way? Um, and everybody has to figure that out, you know, for themselves, from the men and the women. Because these are 
you know, issues that we all deal with. But like all of this is just being very, very, again, uh, having taqwa of God, right? And then the other um, point here, he says, the realization of adherence to the sunnah is through caution and excellent character. So again, just being careful, practicing, you know, the adab of the Prophet ﷺ. Like the Prophet ﷺ had certain, you know, ways that, that he would treat people. Like today we read a hadith um, in another class I did where it said that if two people are sitting, don't go and sit between them. But it's such a beautiful and simple you know, social etiquette that a lot of people don't even do, you know, because if you see, for example, and I was talking about this in the class, that I think women tend to, I think, have this issue more because we are physically more inclined to like, you know, uh, we, we don't mind kind of, you know, that proximity, whereas men are a little bit more guarded around physical, you know, um, closeness. So anyway, but think about you know, why that hadith was relayed to us. Because the Prophet is teaching us that when you see people in a private conversation, two people, it, the hadith specifically was, don't go sit between them unless they invite you. Why? Because they could be having a very private, intimate conversation about something very important. And just because you're overly excitable and you're, like, happy to see them, you should know that, you know what, the way they're sitting, this is where I just read the room, that could be a private conversation. And I'll wait to respectfully be invited. And until then, I'm going to practice some restraint and just keep myself busy. Simple etiquette, right? But why did he teach us that? Is because these are the ways that we preserve the bonds, you know, of in our communities, in our families, in our relationships. So just being cautious and always having excellent character. We don't always have to say what we, what we think. I mean, I know it's hard for some people because we live in a culture that celebrates this forthrightness. And if you ha think it flaunted and all this nonsense, that's not our, our way. There's many times where you should actually do the very opposite. Because what you are thinking is foul. What you are thinking is inappropriate. What you are thinking could potentially cause issues for other people. So it's actually better to not say it, right? But this is where looking at the, you know, uh, reading the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but also reading, you know, um, the Shama'il, for example, right? The Shama'il is the physical descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but also many of his character traits. Um, Qadi Iyad's Ashifa shifa is another extraordinary text that we have in English that gives you insight into how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did everything from the way he walked the way he sat, the way he ate, the way he drank, the way he moved and, and talked to people of all backgrounds. So just learning those etiquettes will make you a better, more, more refined human being. And that's how you then stay consistent. And what you do is you adopt a new way of being. Because all of us, from our respective cultures, our families, we are raised, right, a certain way. And we carry you know, those things forward into adulthood. However, our parents were, we model that behavior, the culture that we were raised in. But at a certain point, when you accept that you are a practicing Muslim, you have to discard your cultural identities, right? The, the bad of the, uh, the uh, or the, I shouldn't say fully, but I mean to say that discard this identity that is informed primarily by culture and by everything else and say, I'm going to be the best version of me, which is adopting prophetic character. And then the good that you have of your character and of your family are that, is that which aligns with the Prophet's character, right? And anything else, you discard it, right? For example, like in this culture, cursing is very common, right? Um, I was speaking to some young kids. I mean, I teach, mashallah, so I, I teach different ages, but I was speaking to some um, high school and middle middle school kids who recently met up with some other students and they were just kind of talking but they were shocked at how cursing is very common now in the Muslim community like you know sisters with hijab dropping f-bombs brothers you know with beards and these youth who Allah again has given them that fitra they themselves were like, it's really weird. And that's exactly what one of them said. He said, it's really weird. I don't know why they curse so much. It's not our way. That is completely antithetical to everything of our tradition. So if you're doing anything that counters 
the Provosal Aesunam's character, it's a defect in you. And if you don't see it as a defect that you want to correct, then there's a problem, right? Because his is perfect character. And we're all defective, of course, in many ways, but the point is to become better. And so that's how we do it. Then the realization of indifference to others, acceptance or rejection is through patience and trust in Allah. So we don't, um, you know, wait around to be invited or, or worry about being rejected. We just say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of that. He'll take care of me. I don't need to be, uh, and I don't need to people please. Because as long as I, he's pleased with me, then I'll just be patient through all of that. The realization of contentment is through acceptance of what one is given and turning over the management of one's affairs to Allah. So again, that's one of the cures also for envy. Like if you have hasad, you're supposed to sit there and think about, wait a second, who is the one who distributes to his creation? Everything, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distributes. He's the one who gives everybody wealth. He gives you know, different qualities, different traits. Not all of us have, you know, we're not, all, we're not all the same, right? But he's the one who's determined how much our portions are of this dunya. So when you are expressing, uh, you know, uh, your, your dis uh, satisfaction with what you have, there's an allegation there against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that somehow he has shorted you Somehow he has slighted you. Audhu billah, right? It, it, so this is where you have to, again, go against your own nafs and say, no, I am satisfied with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. And if this is what he has determined for me in this world, I'll take it. I will take it. Because he knows best. I don't know what's good for me, right? And so whatever your tribulation is, that's how we... we, um, we we are satisfied and then we turn over everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the realization of turning back to Allah constantly is through praise and gratitude in times of prosperity and taking refuge in Him in times of affliction. So sabrun jameel is what? At the strike of a calamity, you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then gratitude is a constant practice. Like every moment, as much as you can, to be in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to bear witness to His uh, you know, gifts to you. Never minimize the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to you. When you see things that are like, wow, like that's that's shocking or that there's no coincidence. You know, if you follow me on social media, you know I talk about this a lot. But never minimizing things that are even what we would call coincidental or serendipitous as being, oh, that's just fun. It's just like, oh, can you believe this happened? No, that's, that's a gift from Allah for you. It's a really momentous thing. Hold on to it. And, you know, an advice I give to people, I actually have it right here on my phone. I have a notes folder of all these moments where there's no way you can tell me that's a coincidence from God. No way. I'll never believe it. I'll never believe it because the odds of all of these things aligning are just too, too low uh, for, 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 um, for it to be just a coincidence. It's by design. So, you know, just constantly being witness to um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gifts and, and praising him as he so deserves. So now these are the, as I mentioned, um, and I, I want to leave some time for Q&A, uh, but I wanted to also introduce the next section here. So that was a review from our first session. And the reason why I also wanted to do a review is because our recording unfortunately got cut off um, last time. So we didn't even get a lot of this, but alhamdulillah. Uh, but now, so what he's done is he laid that those five, right? And now he's giving us the... Um, the five foundations that precede those five. So it's basic, or he's sorry, the foundations of the preceding five are the following. So it's basically how do we get to those five? Well, this is what we need. And so he starts us off with first, exalted aspirations. So if you want to achieve what we just set out, right, this beautiful uh, roadmap for um, a path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you the believer, the seeker, me, we have to have high aspirations, which means we have to move our focus from dunyawi concerns to the akhirah, right? And we have to align our goals in life with that, the investing in our other world, because this world is, is, is temporal and it's just a means to get to the other side.
So if you're stuck here in the dunya world realm, everything is going to be dunya focused. My job, marriage, kids, and that's what people end up squandering so much of their life away, fixated on getting things that we just accumulate and we want to accumulate, we want to get, you know, whatever it is that everybody else has, I want my peace, right? It's kind of like when they, you know, when the, when the wars would, would happen and then all the soldiers come to collect the booty of the war, right? And everybody's kind of scrambling and running to get their peace. We're just like, but subhanAllah, again, that's your, your, your eyes on the wrong prize, because there's a fortune on the other side that you're not even thinking about. And that's where exalted aspirations will lead you. So instead of wasting your time, you know, um, I mean, subhanAllah, you know, people are free to do whatever they want. But, you know, you, you, I know people who have spent thousands of dollars on self-help, like, books. Or, um, you know, they go on these, I don't know, what, what you would even call them. But it's like very indulging kind of experiences and it's all gimmicky and it sounds really great but a lot of it is just you know it's it's like I said gimmicky right so you're gonna spend thousands of dollars to go get spa treatment to go to this vacation place and go tan yourself or whatever beautification things that people do um, whatever or other adventures that people will spend a lot of money on but when it comes to taking a class learning aqidah or Qur'an, suddenly they're complaining about the price. Astaghfirullah, like really? So you would rather spend, you know, $500, $1,000 on these packages to go and, you know, eat food or go to these resort kind of places and you spend so much of your earned money on that because to fill your stomach. But then the moment you have an opportunity to learn something or even like for Umrah or Hajj or do something spiritual, the price becomes a factor. Your aspirations are low. You're stuck in the world. You're not thinking about maybe if I go take this class, it's going to be, you know, a means for me to get my prayers right or, or start to learn more about how to read the book of Allah or just feel more connected. You know, maybe it's going to be the means to something even greater and greater and greater. And then that will be mountains and mountains and mountains of reward for me on the day of judgment. Nobody's, where's that thought process, right? So we're quick to indulge the nafs, but then we let these barriers come between us and greater goals, which, which are meant to draw us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the first thing. If you want all of this, you have to have exalted aspirations. The next thing he mentions is maintaining Allah's reverence. This is very essential. Other faiths, I mean, I cringe. I cringe at the way that, you know, may Allah forgive them because they, it's all learned. But when I hear people of other faith traditions, the way they speak of God, it's so wrong. It's you know, they, they, first of all, anthropomorphize, they give very human-like qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is an offense to, you know, to our uh, sense, senses as Muslims because we hold Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the highest, um, I mean, he, he's, he's the most praised and we, we, we would never speak of him uh, the way that other people speak of God. So it's, but we should also add to that. So this is where not just praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also, as I mentioned, having the best opinion, right? He says, I am in the opinion of my servant. So what does that mean? Well, when you have a high opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will literally confirm that opinion for you. So when you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He is, He's perfect. There's no, there, he does not make mistakes. So what's happening to our brothers and sisters all the way across the world is not a mistake of God, Allah. And this is how some people who have no idea of who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is, and they speak of of you know horrors and you know evils in the world with this acu acu you know accusatory sort of tone or just this. It's just very. It's disgusting, honestly. I can't, to me, it's very repulsive. But they don't know Allah. They're talking about something else, right? We don't do that. Allah doesn't make mistakes. Children dying is not a mistake of God. There, and we don't, you know, we, we don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions. That's the bottom line. Who are we to ask Allah, the creator of the universe, questions about what he does with his own property? We all belong to him, right? Inna lillahi wa inna rajiun. So who are we to question what he does with his own creation? 
We're nothing. We're insignificant. And again, I'll bring it back on a human level. Any one of us would be offended if a person called us into question over how we dress, over what we do with our property, right? Or even, God forbid, you give me parenting advice that I don't agree with. Who do you think you are? These are my children. Oh, really? So, you know, we get very touchy when, when it's turned back on us. But then the creator of the universe, we think we have the audacity to ask questions. So what we do is we have a good opinion of Allah and we say, you know what? All of it at a certain point will be made clear. And I'm not going to sit here and judge the events that are unfolding as though they in any way project anything negative on my creator, but rather look to me and humanity as a whole and how, look at our species. I mean, what are the largest industries right now, the most profitable industries in the world? Do you know what they are? It's sickening. Sickening. Pornography. Drugs of every kind. Right? We have an epidemic of human trafficking. The, 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 it's un, I mean, the list goes on and on about the evils that our species has put into the world. And so when we're seeing, when we see all of this unfold in front of us, these are the signs of the latter days, it's because we've forgotten our Lord. We've forgotten our Creator. And then when we go distant and we start to, you know, just spend all of our time and energy, you know, filling our nafs and, and that's all we're consumed with, then what do you expect? So having Allah's reverence, maintaining that is so essential. To just constantly praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nope, I'm not going to entertain a single negative thought of my Creator. Because I know that He has made all of this manifest. None of this is, should be a surprise to any of us. And if it's a surprise or we're shocked by it all, it's because we don't read. We're not reading history. History repeats itself. We're not reading the Hadith literature that has foretold all of the signs. All of the lesser signs of the Day of Judgment are here in the world right now. All of it. The Prophet ﷺ gave us incredible uh, gifts by telling us what to look out for. So he told us all of this stuff that would happen, including mass killings and angry people like uh, just taking over the world. He told us. So maintaining Allah's reverence, then expending oneself in excellent service of others. This is really also essential. If you want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like all the prophets and many of the saints and, and the righteous, there is a path of service you have to be on. So you can't just be like self-absorbed, right? Service khidma is paying it forward, giving back to your family, your community, something that teaches you all of those beautiful characteristics and qualities of patience, all those virtues that we seek. It comes to the path of service. That's why all the prophets had what in common they were shepherds, right? They had some shepherding influence because taking care of a creation, right? Having to feed, look after, you know, in the great hadith of, of uh, you know, ala kulkum ra'in, the Prophet said, all of you are shepherds. Shepherding is part of the believer's path, being in service, in other words, right? So this is very important. And then I love that he, the language, because none of this is, again, uh, you know, it's it's purposeful what he says. Expending oneself in excellent service of others. So you do it with a smile. You willingly serve other people. So what does this look like in a practical sense? When you come to the masjid, okay, and you see shoes all over the place, and you see people, um, you know, struggling, carrying things, you don't just walk by and go, oop, I want to go get my spot and sit and be cozy and wait for my friends. No. It's not, that's not service. What you say is, there's a need in front of me, and I'm a believer, and Allah's witness, and this is His house, and I will keep the sacred sanctity of this house. So as much as I'm here to enjoy a program, or I'm here to see friends and loved ones, Allah's watching me, and He put me where I can see something. I'm witnessing something that's out of place, right? Which, by the way, the meaning of adab right, is to put things back in their place. So when we see something out of place, we fix it. And this is missing, and the proof of that is go into any Muslim or masjid, go into the bathroom, and look at the havoc that's been wreaked in, in our bathrooms that nobody wants to touch, and we wait for the cleaning person to come. But if you yourself aren't even mindful over yourself, 
and you're just gonna splash water everywhere and leave slippers turned over and just throw your paper towel and boom, you're out because you gotta go run back to the event. Where is that awareness that Allah's watching me? I'm here, maybe I have a little bit more time than someone else does and I can quickly do something, do something. You don't have to clean the whole bathroom. Nobody's asking you to go get a brush and start cleaning toilets. But being in the service of others is being mindful and present that Allah is giving you opportunities for reward. And the best deeds are done when no one is watching. Those are the best deeds. So when you, you know, are walking in a, in a space and you see something, again, out of place, you don't need people to tell you to do that. Just do it, right? And, I mean, there's many ways that service of others can be... Um, done but doing it with excellence is really important and then fulfilling one's uh, resolves again if you're a person that takes your word seriously then when you say you're going to do something do it don't be a person of lip service of empty promises of you know um, just these far-fetched ideas that never culminate into anything because you're so uh, worried about trying to keep up with people and you throw out all this, oh yeah, I'm going to do some of this. Just do it. Set out to do it and make the niyyah. And of course, if you are if you want to do it, you have to tie that intention with asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help because you're never going to do anything on your own. And that's why in the Quran, right, in Surah Al-Kahf, what are we told? That when you set out to do something on the the next day, on the morrow or tomorrow, always say what? Inshallah. Because if you think that you can do anything, even whatever plan you have, without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without His facilitation or without Him in any capacity, you are deluded. Because it's only through Him that you do anything, that you're breathing right now. It is only by the grace and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are able to congregate and speak and breathe and all of these functions are happening without any effort on our part. Like just think about that, right? These automatic like body responses, I forgot, what are they called? They're, there's, I forgot there's a branch of it. I've studied in biology, but now I forgot. You know, like our breathing apparatus, like the ability to do things autom without any thought, right? We're not thinking. I'm not thinking about breathing. Right? What is it called? Involuntary, thank you. Involuntary, right? There's no will, there's no thought. I'm not telling heart beat, pump, heart, lungs, take in, nothing. It's happening. But why is it happening? Because Allah subhanahu wa is the sustainer. He's the one who's maintaining us, sustaining us. So have the humility to what? Plan. Have uh, um, your plans, and when you make those plans, be a person of execution. Fulfill one's resolves. That's the fourth quality that you need in order to get to the first five. Do you get how this works? It's really amazing. And then the final one, magnifying one's blessings. This is such an important practice. I cannot tell you, if you want to see real transformation in your life, like wherever you are, if you feel like you're in a rut, you're stuck, things aren't moving for you in any direction, if you want to see transformation in your life, practice gratitude. Start to force yourself to see the good and to really sit with what an immense blessing it is that I have, whatever it is, you know, you fill in the blanks, you know, but do that. And there's so much research that shows the transformative power of gratitude journaling, of being a person who's just in that mindset of witnessing good, that it's like a gift that keeps on giving, right? And so unfortunately, you know, we live in a time where although that you know, should be um, should be something that we we can do. What's happened is because of social media and the effect of seeing so much abundance. Right, we have a distorted view of the world. So when you're opening up, especially if you're on like the more visual platforms, right? If a big part of your day is spent opening, it, you know, up to Instagram or TikTok or Reels, where it's just videos and it's all perfectly curated and tailored and you know filtered and these messages that are coming from people of authority you know there's a lot of um, now a days gurus and people with the sage wisdom and everybody just seems to have it all figured out so you're going through this and you're just like wow I'm a total loser I have like absolutely nothing going on all these people have 
perfect lives. Their their homes are Im immaculate. Their children are perfect. They're going on these um, uh, amazing vacations. And then they're like all sages. Like they have like, wisdom and they can speak. Like it's just f like, you know, <laughs> stuff flowing out of them. And then you just th think of yourself and you're always going to feel like you don't have what they have. And so then it makes you feel like you do the opposite of this. You start to minimize yourself because everybody else is magnified. You get it? This is why it's very dangerous to be on those platforms because it's distorted. You, when you look at your reality and you actually start to dissect all the blessings, all the things that you have been given and then contrast them to 99% of the world. And I'll throw that out there, even though that's probably doesn't, I don't know if there's any science to back that up, but I really think that a vast majority of people on this planet are suffering in ways that we cannot comprehend because those stories don't make it to the highlight, to the reels, right? And to the TikToks. I mean, very rarely. Although earlier today I saw like a horrible story out of the a, of a man. It was on Twitter, just came up. But I, I mean, these things are true. They're real. He, one of his body parts had a, a growth that was uncontrollable. Like it just was growing out of control. 80 pounds it had grown into. So he was walking and he, he can't leave the house. He's like, I'm a prisoner of my own body. You know, people have tumors and they have all these horrible health problems. So it's like those things, unless you're watching some rare documentary, you might not see that. But I think a lot of people suffer. You know, they suffer with drug addiction, with alcohol addiction, abuse, trauma, um, health problems. So then, then when you start to see, wow, alhamdulillah, I have health. I have, you know, wealth in the bank, I have food, I have clothes that keep me warm, I have a home, I have a bed that I love. I know a lot of us, we invest in bedding, good bedding, right? Just think about how many people right now, like if we're really being honest, that was one of the first things I thought of for these poor, you know, children especially, like, wh where are they possibly sleeping? Like, I don't know if you've thought about that, but like, homes have been decimated, it's dust, it's rubble. Where are they sleeping? I don't know. Is it concrete slabs? Is it just because hospitals can't contain thousands and thousands of people? And I don't know if people are. On the floor. And see, I don't know how the, I'm sorry. Yeah, disease. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Where are they using the restroom? And then, um. So restroom, you know, bedding, what's happening, right? And then, like today, subhanAllah, I mean, just randomly, I, I'm reminded of it because it disturbed me. I was driving in Union City, and there was a construction site, and I saw a man on the ground. He was Half of his body was hanging over the, the street. He was wearing an orange uh, parka or jacket, so I thought he was initially a construction worker, construction worker taking a nap. And then as I drove closer, I was like, oh, my God, that's just a man. Like, he... He looks like he's, I wasn't sure if he was alive. There were so many cars. So I had, I called the Union City Police Department. And I was like, there's a man. And I told him exactly where the location was. And then she was like, yeah, thank you, ma'am. Someone else has also called about him. Basically, what we're going to go on the scene. It was so disturbing to see that. So now multiply that. Look at the scale we're talking about. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And then, by the way, I had a statistic the other day. There's thousands of pregnant women <laughs> that they're, in Gaza, like, I, I don't know. But it's like, imagine you're in your third term and you're about to have a baby and you don't know, like you have, there's, like you said, disease spreading, no sanitation, no bedding, like what, the discomfort of, of pregnancy on top of all that, like, Ya Rabbi. So the point is, whatever you think you're not happy about your life, Wallahi, if you started to look at the circumstances the majority of people are under, you would be so grateful to Allah. You would feel like you're living like a king or a queen or like, you know, a person of immense privilege. And so magnifying your blessings is a daily practice. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, nothing to complain about. Actually saying those words, vocalizing that. When someone's complaining, alhamdulillah, we shouldn't complain, we're so grateful, Allah so, so 
generous. Allah is so generous. And watch what happens to you when you make that your existence. If if the 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 you know uh, if you don't start feeling flooded with with really good at feelings and emotions, but also just your reality, your circumstances may change very very quickly because gratitude is rewarded, right? So Subhanallah. Sisters, I, I'm sorry, I wanted to leave at least 15 minutes for Q&A, but those are the five. Actually, let me just read one small section and then we'll stop for today. It says here, he says here, he whose aspirations are exalted is raised in rank. So he's going through these five and now just giving commentary. Allah maintains the respect of he who preserves his reverence. So your respect in the sight of people will be maintained when you show that reverence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, and this is called the law of reciprocity. We see this theme a lot where Allah, you know, do unto others as you would want done unto you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his generosity will reward us with what we put out into the world. So you're a generous person, he'll be generous with you. You're a kind person, he'll be kind with you. Compassionate, merciful, all of those virtues, it will be repaid to us. He who does that which he resolves to do is assured continual guidance. So just as you're a person of commitment, then that is your reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you hidayah because the hidayah is only through him. He who deems blessings to be great by his own eye has shown gratitude. Right? So when you're uh, magnifying your blessings, that's what you're doing. Right? You're, you're witnessing and so you're showing gratitude. And he who is grateful ensures an increase in blessings from the giver of gifts according to the promise of the truthful one. So that's what it is. You will, you're insured more blessings in your life if you continue to be uh, grateful. Right? right? If you are grateful, I will increase you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us. So alhamdulillah, these are the first um, uh, sections of this incredible document. We will continue next month, but any uh, questions about anything or any comments? Anything anybody wants to share? Okay. I will just give a little bit of advice for the sisters who are watching and those who are here. Right now, as I mentioned, we're in very difficult times and I know that there's kind of a heightened sense of you know, awareness and we should be on alert, especially those who wear hijab. So please, sisters, take precautions. I think it's necessary and I don't want to be an alarmist but I also don't want to hear any tragic news. The Bay Area, as progressive and liberal as people are, there's a lot of sick people here as well. Um, there was a sister in Burlingame I watched today. She was spat on. Uh, I didn't see the full um, uh, interview, but she was her identity was concealed. She was, I think, a Jordanian sister, uh, spoke in Arabic, and she had a translator, but she said some men approached her in the Burlingame area, and he was he spat on her. <laughs> so this is right here in California so I think we should really practice caution and what that means is um, you know just making sure that you're uh, you have you're, you're with people you're not alone especially in areas that are kind of like sketchy or you're not, you're not sure about uh, please be careful and then also like in the car I need to do this as well for those of you who wear, wear hijab like you should have like a hat or something you know you wear your hijab but if you're driving, especially at night, just kind of, you know, disguise yourself a little bit. I think it's good practice, at least now, to just put on a little hat or a visor or something because we don't want to draw, or if you have tinted windows, you're fine, but, you know, there are things that we can be proactive about and there, that doesn't compromise your faith. You're not a weak Muslim. No, you're a person who's practicing hikmah. And uh, remember that, you know, the aim of sharia, the five maqasid, is the preservation of life. So we are fully in our right to try to preserve our safety in our life by taking these precautions. So, yes. Sure. Right? 
Absolutely. No, it's a very good question. So the question was, like in the event that someone accosts you, like this sister who was spat on, what is the uh, position, like what in our Sharia, or what, 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 what can we do in order to defend ourselves? Can we, should we, um, you know, respond uh, in any way and, and in what way? I think every situation is going to call for a, a response, right? Because you have to also be aware of you're, you know, have that situational awareness, like, can you do something that would not make it worse, right? Because you don't know if, some, if that person has a weapon, you know, you have no idea. So I would say, always err on the side of caution and say, you know, if there are people around you and you feel like you're supported and maybe there's, you know, it's like a more public space and you would be protected, then you can certainly, you know, say something if you feel the need to. We don't have this idea of just letting people attack us and not defending ourselves. You have the right to defend yourself, but if you want to take it to a point of saying something to correct that person or just to feel like this is wrong and I need to, you know, do Amr bin Maruf or something, you know, I need to set the... Then I think it, it's very situational. There, one answer won't fit because every situation is going to require an assessment. And so make the assessment based on your feeling of safety. And not every personality is up for something like that, right? There's some temperaments where they fight, flight, freeze. They wouldn't know what to do. Um, but, you know, like I'm Pashtun, hot-blooded, I will admit it. You're likely going to get something from me, you know? And that's just my personality. I've had enough experience in life where I don't tend to just let things like that go. But not everybody, I think, is that comfortable, you know, being outspoken and that's okay because there's no uh, right or wrong in this it's a matter of what you have assessed so I would say assess the situation but I don't think you should in any way try to provoke people like that because we're living in a time where there's a lot of mental health problems a lot of violence people are I mean I've seen enough videos where I'm shocked at how disproportionate the reactions are you know someone um, gets the wrong order and a person is like ready to kill them I mean what is this so we're not living in times where people are rational or civil and you could expect that oh they would have a sudden change of heart and oh now you're doing that <laughs> you're probably gonna have you know it's gonna turn into something bigger so I would say even for myself there are many times where I have just chosen to not say anything not because of a weakness, but rather of, I have children and I don't want to, you know, compromise my safety or other people's safety. I don't want to incite someone to even further violence who clearly may have a mental health problem. So that's hikmah, you know, but if you feel like, you know, it's a different circumstance, maybe it's a, like a more controlled environment, someone that you know, a coworker, and you don't feel that threat, there may be a different response. Yeah. But I think, you know, the law or, you know, we have to, again, look at the, the time that we're in and just be very careful. And as women, we already have targets, you know, on us. So we just, I think, have to be even more careful, inshallah. Thank you for the question. Alhamdulillah. and sisters, I don't want to keep you longer. We'll, inshallah, end in dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa la asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa alladhina amanu. وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسيفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاك الله خيرا thank you very much everyone inshallah and uh, I don't know about next month's dates yet. Um, I think they're, we're doing them the third Thursday of every of every month. So I, inshallah, it should be up um, on the newsletter. But the Saturday session, if you don't know about it, we do a Saturday thicket as well. Um, that for next month won't happen, but we do have one this Saturday. So this Saturday at 10 o'clock, we'll be here for thicket, inshallah. And you're all welcome, anytime. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.